Um, now I have the distinct privilege of honoring one of the greats in our, our program, the greats in our specialties, and uh, certainly one of the greatest contributors to osseointegration in my lifetime. Thank you for coming to honor Dr. Oli Jensen, this year's recipient of the Noble BioCare Brandmark Osseointegration Award, which is the highest honor bestowed by the Academy of Osseointegration Foundation. As you know, the award is presented annually by the Osseointegrative Foundation to honor an individual whose impact on and leadership in education, research, and charitable causes is, has contributed so greatly throughout the field of dentistry. This year's recipient, Dr. Oli Jensen, has certainly been a leader in all of these areas. To tell you a little bit about Dr. Jensen, he did his undergraduate degree at the University of Utah, his dental school at Northwestern University, his oral and maxillofacial surgery at the University of Michigan, and where he received his certificate in oral and maxillofacial surgery. He's a diplomat of the American Board of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery. You'd think I'd know how to say that. And he has been on the board for the American Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery for many years. He served as editor of the Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery Tissue Engineering Journal and is presently associate editor of JOMI. He's authored five books, 25 book chapters, and over 80 journal articles. He's chaired the Consensus Conference in 1996 and in 2014, and he's presented close to 200 presentations at peer-reviewed meetings. And those of you who know the effort that goes into all of these things, it's just formidable. He has an incredible family who we're so honored and privileged to have here today to see him honored in this manner. He currently serves as clinical associate assistant professor at NYU, at the University of Michigan, and the University of Colorado at Denver. And it is my great honor and distinguished pleasure to honor someone as such as Dr. Oli Jensen. So join me, please. Thank you. What I like about this group is, you know, all of you have known me face to face. And a lot of you have been in my office and operated with me or seen me operate. It's really, it's really special when, when people have seen you down in the trenches and, and you're worried about your surgery and so on and, and you have this collegial attitude of, wow, you know, we're in this together. It's a great honor to be um, recognized by the Academy of Osseo Integration. Um, you know, some of us were here at the very, very first two or three meetings we had a very, very small group. I don't know if we could even fit in this. We could, the whole academy could fit in this room, right? And, uh, you know, that was really, really something else. Um, I have worked with several restorative dentists in this room from around the country, and especially uh, in uh, Denver, Colorado. I, I tell you, when I first uh, re was uh, informed that this award was coming my way, I really thought of the dentists that I work with. And I have come to a lot of the offices here. And I better not mention names. I just, there's just so many. Um, but I do appreciate every one of you individually and personally. So as I thought about what I could talk about, and I have my family here, wonderful kids and their, and their spouses. My wife's here, Marty. Um, you know, I thought of, you know, what, what, they'd never heard me speak before, I don't think. Though, I used to have my uh, slides in my furnace room. <laughs> the only place where they were allowed. And, uh, you know, you every lecture with those carousels and they would start spack, stacking up. Uh, I remember going went to one lecture and I had 12 carousels. Can you imagine that? It was, it was very embarrassing, but um, I, I had, I, my kids would see the lectures being prepared in the furnace room and other places that, where we live. So they get a chance to see me in action a little bit, and my wife too, all of you, it's very special for me. As I thought about 
what I would want to talk about is I think I want to talk about something that hasn't been spoken about that I've ever heard and actually talk about people, talk about patients. Um, it's a tender thing to treat a human being. And <clears throat> as I thought about all the patients that I've treated over the years, I wanted to talk to you about 100 of them. And then I thought, I want to talk to you about 200 of them. Beautiful, beautiful people. But uh, I'm going to just, I asked uh, three patients to come in this past month. And Clear Choice, who uh, uh, Kevin Mosher's here, asked if he would let me film these patients for interviews. <clears throat> and then I had one other interview previously. And so I have four patients that I have interviews from. And the idea is that we as doctors, as treating people, you know, we're treating human beings. And they're in difficult ways sometimes, but we don't really realize it. And we, we may make mistakes because we don't connect with, with people. And so I've uh, got this picture up here, and I titled it Dental Implant Treatment of the Human Being kind of de-emphasizing um, the word dental implant. <clears throat> and as we go along, I will talk about some of the technology and different surgeries that I've done and, and, and tried to, you know, publish about and so on. And so you'll get a little bit of, of medicine while we're, we're doing this uh, kind of a social uh, um, uh, talk. You know, the... The author, Alice Walker, I was trying to distill down what her book, The Color Purple, is all about. Maybe you've seen the movie. And there's a statement in there, everything want to be loved. Um, you know, that's a lot of times what's happening with our uh, patients as they come in, they're asking for one thing, but they really want something bigger and uh, more um, encompassing than we kind of think about a lot of times. I like this joke. I think I'll find I'm one of the most empathetic doctors around. I don't do this. I think Dane Boytet does it. Be careful if you go to Jacksonville. But anyway, um, I'm not, this is something more than empathy I'm talking about. But what Empathy means is impassion, impassion with another human being. Hopefully you're impassion with your spouse and your children. And um, but we have a special relationship with, with our patients. And think about that, am I impassion with that person that I'm, uh, that I'm treating? Now I have had difficulty being a doc, and I'll kind of go through that, but it has to do with these two quotes from physicians. A good surgeon operates with his hand, not with his heart. So I've always tried to, you know, had the brain in there. Am I doing the right thing, and could I do it, you know, technically correct, and so on. And then look at this statement from Diane Gabaldon. A surgeon's intent is entirely benign, but he or she is laying violent hands on someone and must be ruthless in order to be effective. We can't let our emotions carry us away, right? We just, you know, really got to be direct in order to be effective. And so Mark Twain says this comment, and this is really disturbing. Surgeons and anatomists see no beautiful women in all their lives, only a ghastly stack of bones with Latin names on them and a network of nerves and muscles and tissues inflamed by disease. You know, are we going to be that kind of person, that kind of doc? Well, I am very introspective, uh, very focused. Um, not to brag, but I just want to tell you a story. When I was at the University of Utah, I was uh, in the biology department, and I would sit under the microscope eight or ten hours a day. And 
it was it was just heaven. I was just focused on this little spot. So then when I was at Northwestern, um, I was really big into anatomy, and I could sit for hours studying anatomy. And when the we took anatomy with the medical school and the dental school together, and so when we first the, took the first exam. Um, I basically didn't miss anything on the exam. And so we were asked to go to the dean's office. And I was so focused that I thought, well, I don't want to take the time to interfere with my time to go to the dean's office to get recognized. The other problem I had is I only had one pair of pants. They were purple. That's true. And uh, it's very embarrassing to try and go get recognized, and you, and, and you only want one pair of pants. But the reason I tell that story is um, I had a problem as a doc, and that was that I was looking down in the microscope, and I wasn't really looking into the heart of the patient. When I um, was talking to my dad one time, I said, uh, Dad, <coughs> um, you know, he was unhappy with me. And he wanted to give me some advice, and he's a man of few words. And he said this to me. He said, Oli, you don't see people. Look up. And so this was the counsel I received from my father to help me in my life. And maybe some of us are like this as well. We're so concentrating on the details of you know, osteointegration in this case that we really don't look up and see see the patient and really connect with them. So that's just a little personal background as to some of the things I've had to overcome and think about. And looking up, these are the four patients I chose to talk about, very uh, tender people, and um, some of them recent, some of them older. And these could be your patients too. All of us have these. These aren't the four best patients I ever treated. They just, they came to mind as I thought to illustrate connecting with the human being. Um, I had a fellowship uh, that people come and train with me and my first fellow was an Orthodox Jew, uh, Robert McGuris, very fine uh, doctor is in um, Philadelphia now. And when he finished with me, he gave me this gift called the round band. And Many of you know what this is, but maybe a lot of us don't. I have this up on my wall. Um, the Rambam was written by Maimonides. He's a rabbi physician from about the 12th century. And it's a prayer. And I've got this up on my wall, but think about this when you want to sort out your own brain. This is what he said. Supreme God in heaven, before I begin my holy work to heal a human being, whom your hands form, I grant, uh, I pour out my entreaty before your throne of glory that you grant me the strength of spirit and courage to do my work faithfully and that the ambition to amass riches and goodness shall not blind my eyes from seeing rightly. As we uh, were trying to develop the culture in clear choice, you know, getting all these the doctors together, uh, it could have been could have become an egomaniac uh, feast. You know, where we're th we start thinking that we're we're in we're pretty cool people, and so I presented this to the the Clear Choice doctors to try and help with our culture, so that we're focused on taking care of people and not worrying about how cool we are. And this applies to this little. Uh, Rambam prayer of Maimonides can apply to our own practice in our own lives that we don't lose focus on who's really important in this uh, endeavor. Now, Mary Oliver is one of my favorite uh, poets. She says, what will you do with that one wild and precious life? So I thought about this for myself, um, and I, I just didn't know, know what to do. And so this is one of those other things where I came to my father. I said, well, what should I do with my one wild and, and precious life? And once again, very P 
pithy and very profound. And this one little statement, I want you to want to just help people. And so when you're doing your, your great work, I hope that underlies everything that you do. That's been the theme of, of my life. So when I got in then to um, dentistry, oral surgery, implant dentistry, um, there, was a, there was a period of time where I didn't do anything like that. When I came out of work, came out of school, I wanted to help people. And I thought, what's, what's the area where you can really help people the most in my field? And I don't have too many growth slides, there's one. Um, I thought, well, cancer treatment. So for eight to 10 years in Denver, I got, was in a cancer group. And we did a lot of this major, major work, just really fascinating, helpful work to people. And, um, and we had such a great team, plastic surgeons, ENTs, neurosurgeon, and an oral surgery. And just by chance, um, one of the key doctors died in an accident. And then there was a divorce with one of the other ones. And, and the group broke up right at the time when dental implants kind of came on the scene. And so I thought, maybe I should make a shift. But my training in dental implants, maybe some of you had this, this training too, is that that was like the worst thing in the world that you could ever do is do a dental implant. To take some metal, stainless steel or whatever, and pound it into the jaw or subperiosteal implant. I mean, I would just didn't want to be involved with that. And also, I thought it was kind of trivial that it's not that important to, to change it, to give somebody else an extra tooth or something. And so I didn't, didn't think that was what I wanted to do. But keeping in, in mind with what you're going to do with your life, Carl Brown, a prosthodontist uh, friend in Denver, he sends me this patient. And her name is Bernita. And this is actually not Bernita, but this is a patient like her. Um, so Bernita had had a subperiosteal implant of the upper jaw and it become so infected that when it was removed, there was only palate bone left and the entire maxilla had um, oral antral communication, so communication between the mouth and the sinus. And uh, on top of that, she had such a constrictor of her oral opening that you couldn't even see what I've just described. And as, on top of that, a very uh, kind of a high society, very sophisticated person, and um, was just devastated, crying and so on. And uh, all of a sudden, I realized, you know, maybe this field of implant dentistry is not so trivial after all. So she was reconstructed with an iliac graft. I wish Carl Brown was here. Can you imagine a fixed hybrid bridge being placed, impressions, all the technical things he did in order to get a full arch restoration in someone with scleroderma. Now, scleroderma, for those of you that don't know, they get uh, connective tissue disease and their mouth opening closes gradually and, and all of their tissues uh, freeze up. Well, I treated her and a couple years, I hadn't seen her for few years, a couple years out, her family comes to the office and they're all kind of sullen and they want to tell me that Bernita had died. And sorry. <laughs> so I, I just said, I'm very, very sorry that that happened. And, and they said, you know, we just wanted you to know that Bernita made us come in and express appreciation to you and Dr. Brown for what, all that you did for her. It was that, that important. So teeth, for a lot of people, it's very, very important. It's, it's some place that you really can help people. So I, I turned a corner and went out of that cancer world and into dental implant treatment. 
And it's important, and I've never regretted it. I think it's wonderful what we do. All of you, restorative, all of us. First patient I want to kind of present relates to this gentleman here. Is who deserves dental implant treatment? Maybe you have had deficiency in thinking just the way I have. And you see a guy like this and you dismiss them as less than a human being. Maybe not worthy for implant treatment. I mean, how can a guy like this have anything going on inside of his head? And should we be taking teeth out on him and doing a full, full arch or something? Think about that. So, the very first patient that I wanted to show you 